Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Hello, and welcome back to The Catholic Mama. I'm your host, Christine Mooney Flynn. Thanks for joining me. Uh, this is a new episode, not just a repeat of another episode or another <laughs> podcast, but speaking of the other podcast, that was my husband, Pat Flynn's. Uh, show that we shared last week since I was feeling under the weather. I still have a bit of a stuffy nose and a cough, as does my husband who's joining us. So if you hear hacking in the background, it's just a good old flu season that doesn't want to quit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Kids are a museum of diseases. Yes, I hear it gets better as they get older. I hope so. Yeah, but for right now, we're sniffles and coughs, and but we still wanted to get a podcast done. Um, and this week, I thought it would be fun. Unless there's anything you want to talk about, we can jump right in. Oh, I, I didn't know what the topic was going to be. Yes, you did. We talked about yesterday a little bit. Oh, yes. Okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure you remember? Are you ready for this? I remember. I don't know if I'm ready, but let's okay. do it. Well, we were... we were. But let's okay. do it. Well, we were... we were. Um, actually, this all this spawned because we went to uh, Holy Hill in Wisconsin, which is a, a national shrine. <laughs> oh, and here comes the first set of coughs. And we thought it was kind of kind of funny that there were statues of penitent people kneeling before a statue of Mary, wasn't it? That's right. We even have statues that worship statues. Yeah, that's right. So we were joking that that's what uh, non-Catholics will make fun of Catholics for. And, um, well, that's just a great segue into uh, discussing and, and slaying myths uh, that people have about the Catholic faith. Correct. And I will say that the vast majority of the objections that people have to the Catholic Church who are are Christians are are not really objections to any position that Catholics to any position that Catholics actually hold. They tend to just be gross mischaracterizations or, or misunderstandings. And I can remember one time going to an evangelical church and talking to some of the people there and trying to understand, you know, what they believe. This was before we became Catholic. And um, the preacher said a, a bunch of stuff about Catholicism. And at the time, I was like, that sounds really odd. Like, do, do, do Catholics really believe that? And the wonderful thing about the Catholic Church is they have this little thing called the catechism. And so I went and I, I looked it up and turns out, they don't believe anything like that. And it got me thinking is like, why do you why do you have to argue against a straw man? Why do you have to invent a position to attack the Catholic Church? If if the Catholic Church is wrong, why don't you just state their position accurately and show why it's wrong? Why do you have to constantly invent these Catholic Church does not purport to hold and then and then critique those as if you're if you're doing anything substantive? And that was Fairly consistently, an experience I had in denominations outside of Catholicism is is almost very rarely were they actually critiquing a position that Catholics that Catholics really hold or, or really believe. So I figured, okay, it might be worth it to do an episode and, and clear some of these up. Yeah, I think it was Fulton Sheen who said there are something to paraphrase. There are millions of people in America who think. They they hate the Catholic Church, but not one actually does. That's right. Right. Uh, so which one do you want to start with? Um, well, let's start with the the one that that constantly came up and that was just so utterly false that I think it's it's worth spending some time on, and that's the idea of the sort of classic Protestant objection that that Catholics think that that you somehow have to earn your salvation. Ah, that's a good one. Your salvation. Ah, that's a good one. Uh, that it's all about you know getting those tally marks in the good behavior column and if you have enough tally marks then you'll get into heaven but if not then it's the eternal flames for forever this idea of, of having to earn our salvation this was constantly a critique that i heard going to um, denominations that were not catholic that it's just 
that it's a works based based system, but they they constantly got the idea of good works wrong. And this was one thing that right what like within five minutes of going to the Catholic catechism, I saw wow they just they just never even took the five minutes to read the Catholic catechism to see if this was a position that the church holds. So the short answer here is that Catholics do not believe that you can earn your salvation. They we we do not believe that you can earn your salvation. Our salvation is merited merited to us through the atoning death of Christ. What Christ? What the doctrine of good work says essentially is that we have a role in cooperating with the grace of God. That 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 salvation is a gift, but it's a gift that we can freely accept or free, freely reject. And the idea of Catholic good works is that human cooperation, human free will, still plays a role. So salvation is a gift that is freely extended to all through the merits of Christ. This is the Catholic position, but it's one that we have to assent to. And it's assenting through faith by trying to to imitate Christ or put on Christ. That's what the idea is of good works is about. It has nothing to do with with earning our salvation or working our way into heaven. It has to do with assenting to the grace and to the gift of God and the merits of Christ. And once you actually explain it like that to most most non like they that they agree with that. They, they they're like, say you uh, are say Christ saved you and then go off and be a terrible person. Uh there, there's there is uh a, a yoke and a burden with well, being a Christian. And that's funny because I had a, a conversation with somebody and I had their little equivalent of a catechism and they were pretty much – they were dispensationalists. So they believed like once saved, always saved. And I I asked this person, I said, do you think that you know if somebody professes faith in Christ when they're say 16 at a moment and they're you know, whatever – um, but then they renounce Christ, they, be, they apostatize, they, they become a very hardened atheist, and then they spend the rest of their life attacking religion, mocking Christ, mocking Christians, doing everything they can to pull people away from Christianity, and they hate the idea of religion, they hate the idea of God. Do you think that that person is still saved? And she said no. But I'm like... But <laughs> so she she actually agreed with the Catholic position, but she didn't she didn't know it. She so she believed what Catholics believes, but yet hated the Catholic Church because of the myth that was perpetuated of what she thought the Catholic Church believed, and actually rejected the beliefs of her own church. <laughs> so it was just it was just one of those bizarre things that it's like if if you would just take some time to read your own pseudo catechism I don't even know what they would call it and in the Catholic catechism you would realize no your beliefs are actually fairly I would say they were sensible because they were in line with the Catholic beliefs that you know we have a responsibility to accept God's grace to accept the gift of faith to to accept and cooperate with the merits of Christ uh, to put on Christ um, to, to allow Christ to live within us that's what the idea of good works is about and when you explain like that they they almost always agree with it but the funny thing is, is that at least in this example, and, and of course saved, um, but at least in this example was a case where this person specifically believed what Catholics actually believe, even though she rejected what she thought Catholics believed, and also rejected what her congregation <laughs> believed. So it was just it was very very interesting. Uh, I, I think it goes back that um, Catholicism is the most sensible. It is, and it's intuitive too. Like you know, God gives us free will. So the Catholic Church position says, like, look, if, if if you choose against God and you decide that the only thing you want is yourself, God loves and respects his creature's freedom, and he allows that decision. What is he going to do, force you to be with him? That That isn't respecting creaturely freedom. That isn't a good thing. So the doctrine of good works is showing that God loves and respects his creature's free will. That's really what it's, what it's affirming, and that free will matters, and we have a role to play in this cooperation of this free gift from God, nothing that we could ever do from God, nothing that we could ever do to earn that. It is a gift, it's, it's, and it's through the merits of Christ, but we still have a role to play in, in accepting it. So that's Very that's good. one serious Catholic myth that needs to go away. Yes. Um, and I guess I, I've uh, spoken with or you know followed on in various platforms um, uh, converts 
to Catholicism, and many of them uh, have said the same thing. They had, they had no idea, mm-hmm. and they just knew their church. It's it's interesting to hear a lot of converts say their church did not attack secularism or atheism or the the horrors of the the, the modern age. Uh, what they attacked most was Catholics. Mm. Well, think about it. The only reason and the only way that Protestantism makes sense is if it's parasitic. The only way it can make sense is if Catholicism is wrong. It's inherently parasitic. So, you know, really the only way that these congregations can just the only way that these congregations can justify themselves, even though many Protestants have forgotten where they come from, and that's why they just call themselves just Christians now. We just want to believe, but, but that's just that's just not understanding history. But even though if they forget that or pretend otherwise, this congregation was a good example where they don't call themselves Protestants, they call themselves Christians. Their enti- half of the entire lecture or whatever they call it there, the sermon, was focused on attacking the Catholic Church yeah. in, on positions that ca- the Catholic Church doesn't hold. And that just it, – it, it made me realize, like, again, okay, fine if you have legitimate criticisms, but why do you have to make things up? Why – like – it, it is not venerable nor honorable to to attack a person or a group of people or an entire institution, let alone the Catholic Church, on things that that they don't actually believe. You're just you're you're either ignorant or you're intentionally misleading people, and and neither of those things are, are respectable or the types of things that you should look through for in the leadership of a congregation. I, you know, I haven't studied this much myself, this one thing I'm going to bring up, so I don't know if you have. If not, well, you know, I'll look into it a little bit more and, and talk about it on another podcast, <clears throat> um, is the idea of indulgences. Mm-hmm. Do you know much? I'm not a, a specialist on indulgences, so I can't, I'm not going to be able to speak in, intelligently that's, that's one on of the I am very that, interested in the history of... Yeah, uh, yeah I, of, I don't know enough about it. I, I do know that that is one of the things that Protestants will cite when they say that you have to work your way into heaven, is that you can buy yourself or, or others indulgences. Uh, but I, I think, um, from well, my understanding, it is, it's almost, I, I don't know like how God tallies things up uh-huh. or marks things up. But the indulgence in a lot of ways is just a, a, a way that we can, as humans, mm-hmm. that need tangible things to hold on to. It's a way for us to better understand what we're doing, the good stuff that we're doing may be affecting others. Yeah, indul- others. yeah indulgences have nothing to do with getting into heaven. They're, they're a remittance of a certain purification that we would have to go through in purgatory is my understanding of right. it. Now, and you can even I, I apply wanna... your indulgences to others. Yes. Now – this this makes eminent sense you know christ says you know he gives the example of the prisoner and how you'll never be let out until every single debt is paid um he's he's making a reference to purgatory there but there's things we can do in this life to shape our moral character to shape our soul to shape our disposition that there's that there will be less purification needed as we enter into the next life. And and that, again, is entirely sensible. It's, ver- it's very intuitive when you think about it. I don't know enough about the doctrine specifically to say much more than that, uh, but it's it's definitely not the caricature yes. <laughs> that most people but make can, it out you know, to be. You give the church 50 bucks and you get yourself a, yeah. a day off purgatory. Now, no, no, that there hasn't been corruption in the church. Obviously, there has been, and there's been points where people in positions of power of the church have abused that power. But that has nothing to do with the actual truth of what the church teaches. I mean, there's been corruption right back to Judas, right back to Peter. He denied Christ. I mean, it, corruption just <laughs> runs right through. Uh, but again, you don't abandon Jesus for the sins of Judas, Peter, or any of those people. The church has the authority, the guiding authority of the Holy Spirit. It's just, what the ch- church is is a truth-telling thing. That's what the church fundamentally is and it's through that authority that one we even have scripture to begin with the church gave us the bible the bible is a catholic book uh, and it was through the authority of the church that we can decide what's canon what's not what's reliable what's not Uh, so we can trust the church we can rely on the church but at the same time we don't want to conflate sinners in the church or corruption in the church with which actually teaches or abuses of of power with what the church actually teaches Mm -hmm. so it's important to be able to separate that out yes Mm -hmm. yes um okay so let's i think that's that's a pretty good coverage of that first myth what do you want to tackle next uh, well, I mean, there's there's so many that are so silly that it's it's, know, not, it's, even, it's not even worth spending more than two minutes on. Yeah. But but you 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 have to because they're so they're so prevalent. 
I mean, this idea that, that Catholics uh, uh, worship various things that they don't. I mean, everything statues from statues to Mary, to Mary et cetera. So, I mean, I mean, where do you even want to begin with this? <laughs> Catholics, yeah. we do not worship statues. Wait, Stat- did, did you see the, the meme that goes around at the holidays, which I really like? <laughs> which one's that? It's like, the, you know, uh, the Christmas season <coughs> is the only time, the, the one time of year that Protestants just uh, luckily forget that they don't worship statues, you know, because they have the nativity scenes yeah. out, right? It's the same idea. You know, mm. it's having religious rooms in no way that you're worshiping the statue, the reminder itself. That's correct. You would, you really have to be so confused and, and immature to make this mistake. It's the same thing as if I had, I actually don't, but I should, if I had pictures in my wallet of you and the kids, I'm not loving the picture, Right, the picture reminds me of those who I love. It's it's a it's a physical material thing. God loves matter. He likes physical material things. So they're icons. They're they're to help us to remember who our our worship or veneration is aimed at. It, it it's it's a it's it's something that that actually helps our our spiritual practices of worship and veneration. And how many Christ, Christians, evangelicals, Protestants that we know wear uh, crosses on their necklaces or? It, yeah, there's still icons. Tattoos. They're still, yeah. they're still <laughs> pointing at something. That's right. exactly what it is. So it's not graven images. That's a, a deep mistake that people need to really study that part of the old. It is. So it's not graven images. That's a, a deep mistake that people need to really study that part of the Old Testament. To would make no sense because then you know right after God forbids. Uh, graven images which are not icons he he orders people to inscribe various things um so either he's completely contradicting himself or there's there's more nuance here uh so so what the use of and when you go back through christian history it's important to understand too like the the you know great sort of iconoclast period uh really had much nothing much more to do with trying to appease muslim sensibilities than it did uh anything of of people really thinking that that icons were problematic or anything else so when you actually dive into that and unpack the history too you'll see that this was a a, a venerable and accepted practice really all through christian history uh having icons to help us yeah, we love i think the worship. confusion especially mm-hmm. when you uh are sola scriptura mm-hmm. is you read the the bible and you know God, time and again, makes a point, especially in the Old Testament, of striking down or or condemning pagans because they burned incense, uh, and and kind of and or can't had candles or whatever. And you go into a Catholic church, there's incense, there's votives by the statues, uh, but it's a good reminder that these things like incense or candles, the statues, again, they help draw the senses away from the earthly realm to the heavenly one. That's right. And and to understand the Catholic Church is to understand Judaism. That's where these these come from. And when God condemns graven images and paganism is because the the worship is being aimed at false gods. The statue itself that a, an artisan created rather than Yes, exactly. So just a little bit more and really shouldn't be. And the same mm-hmm. thing with extends to Mary. Yes, and and Mary is such a simple one. You know, Catholics don't worship Mary. We venerate Mary like Christ did. And this is something that that pretty much all Christians agree on, is that you should imitate Christ. Well, Christ followed the commandments perfectly, honoring mother and father, (laughs) venerating mother and father. So we're simply imitating Christ in that veneration, and Christ bestowed the highest possible honor to his mother. Why would he do anything less? He's Christ. He fulfills the commandments perfectly. Right. So if you're going to try and deny that or get away from that, you kind of have to lower Jesus. Um, but so to, to, to venerate Mary as Christ did is, is really having a very high and proper understanding of, of Christ and how he yeah. fulfilled the commandments. Yeah, absolutely. Perfectly. From his from uh, leaving the temple at age 12 to living in perfect obedience, as the Bible says, to uh, his parents, which would include, you know, as the Bible says to uh, his parents, which would include you know, Mary, his stepfather, and and God mm-hmm. for the the next twenty some years, and then also the one of the last things that he did on the cross was behold thy mother, you know, really pointing our focus to her. 
Yeah, and he was saying that to somebody who already had a mom. So yeah, he was obviously he was. What was he doing? He was giving Mary, his mom, to the church. That's what he's doing at that moment. Behold, this is this is your mother. This is the queen of heaven. Um, there's there's so much richness in understanding that, and and really, and really if, if when you go back and you have if you have a church like the Catholic Church that actually has the tradition, you'll have a better understanding that. The idea of Mary is woven in from the very beginning to the very end of Scripture. This mm-hmm. isn't some newfangled thing that somebody, uh, uh, you know, even though Mary's only a referenced in the New Testament, as, you know, a handful of times, a handful of times, uh, she's there mm-hmm. throughout the whole of the history of it. Yeah, yeah. There's a, a book of uh, the Jewish roots of Mary, Mary and the Jewish roots. I, I have my eye on it. I haven't ordered it yet, but... Um, I understand it's it's quite good. You read the Fulton Sheen one. Yep, and uh, uh, and Tim Staples. Um, behold your mother. Yeah, behi- behold my mother, S- your mother, and S- then um, the Archbishop one, and then uh, even just the uh, a couple of episodes ago with um, Dr. Rachel Fulton Brown mm-hmm. talking about the Marian devotion back in the medieval times and how rich that was, and they were certainly um, a more devoted population at that point than than we are currently. Yeah. So again, it's just it, again, it comes down to often a very typical misunderstanding, thinking that that worship is the same thing as veneration. misunderstanding. And like you said earlier, a laziness, a yeah. laziness to figure this out yourself. You're just going to take it for granted. It's always interesting to me. I, mean, I know you and I have talked about this that uh, scoff or or condemn the Catholic Church for having the tradition along with the scripture. Why do you need somebody to tell you what to believe? And yet. They turn around and believe the commentary of their local preacher or their local church. Yeah, they, they have books, their, uh, Christian books they read. They have their own traditions. None of them are, are really, none that I've ever met are really honestly sitting down just reading the Bible and taking whatever they want out of it. They're, they're assuming that this person speaking at the front of the congregation has some sort of knowledge that's worth passing on to them that, they're, that they are accepting on authority, yeah. on authority. Um, so it's 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 often very inconsistent with with the own fundamental premise of of sola scriptura, and you know I guess I have to thank these people because you know for better or worse I guess I wasn't lazy about it and I heard these criticisms of the Catholic Church and I'm like you know I just I want to look into that <laughs> and then what do you know I start reading the Catholic Catechism I'm like wow this is no I start reading the Catholic Catechism I'm like wow this is not at all what they were saying. But this actually makes a lot of sense. <laughs> so they kind of steered me in that direction a little bit. So well, I'm sure that's not the direction they were hoping you'd go in. <laughs> no, of course not. Yeah, that's the last thing I think that most of them would want you to do. But uh, you know, w- one last thing about Mary mm-hmm. um, is that a friend of ours said, I think that uh, the problem that she has with her church is that she feels like the feminine is missing from it. Yeah, how about that? Yeah. I think I know where you can find that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, just, I mean, like the queen of heaven, right? I mean... The, the, say what you want about women not being priests, but you can't say that the Catholic Church holds a low position for women. I mean, Absolutely it's about not. as high as you can get. Uh, and it's true. And I've always been drawn to that myself. In fact, that they, they say a number of, of people, especially men, who had who might have been uh, atheist or agnostic because they had troubles with their father, for example. They, and, and this is a very common thing. Of people who have common thing, of people who have troubles with their dad, either abusive or distant relationships, uh, tend to skew away from religion because that it, it kind of projects you know, onto God as father, and they want kind of nothing to do with that. Um, quite common, but many of them find their way into the church through Mary, through the maternal thing, and then that leads them back to restoring their relationship with God and mm-hmm. Jesus because that, that maternal was more accessible to them. It wasn't as as scarred or traumatic or, or whatever, and there's a, a number of really powerful conversion stories of men who can can look back and say, yeah, I rejected God because of the, the terrible idea I just had of fathers in general, and I couldn't stand that, and I became very anti-authoritarian. But then it was through that maternal, uh, the calling of Mary, that brought people into the church. And then the other thing I'll say is just like, look, I mean, like, God is trying to make it so obvious that the Catholic Church is through, through the miracles, through, through the miracles, these Marian apparitions, right? Our Lady of Fatima, you look into these things, and these are just inexplicable in any type of naturalistic sense. This is, this is Mary really and truly coming 
showing us, you know, revealing truths uh, about herself, about the church, about the world. And it's always interesting that it's, you know, kind of interesting that it's Mary uh, because, you know, or Our Lady of Guadalupe. Um, you know, I think that that is just very strong evidence and very suggestive of, of, of hey, you know, like, look what's, what's, what's going on here. Look at how high of a position Mary holds, how important she is, yeah. certainly was and still is to Christ. But even throughout continued history and in, in, in apparitions and, and various miracles, it's it's my understanding too that um, um, Mary is also the the gateway to Christianity for cultures, especially um, uh, within the the Fulton Sheen book, um, the world's first love. That's it. Uh, he was saying that um, for Asians, because they they do have strong goddess figures, that the idea of Mary is not so foreign to them. So mm-hmm. they they can slide into Christianity that way. Mm-hmm. And then um, Muslims as well have, they like Mary. Mm-hmm. So they, they can understand that. So there, there she is, uh, you know, well, she's, she's the covenant. So the, 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 um, the Ark of the Covenant. So right. Covenant. Yeah, so mm-hmm. she is the kind of the, the gatekeeper, the, the, to getting into Christianity. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing, Marian dogma. Uh, it really is when you take the time to, to unpack it and understand it. It's, it's like, like many things in Catholicism, a rich, deep and rewarding tradition when you yeah. really dive in. Well, I'm, I'm happy to say that I never hated her, mm-hmm. but I just didn't understand her, but I'm glad that I never cast judgment either way. Mm. I just, I didn't know. And now that I'm, now that I'm starting to understand, I can really, and, you know, I, I, and before I'd be like, I, I don't, I don't get this Mary thing, mm-hmm. but I'm, you know, as I'm studying, it makes more and more sense. Mm-hmm. And I find myself praying to her a lot more often. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you want to go through one more, maybe? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, another common one that kind of ties into Mary is why do you worship saints or why do you uh, yeah. why do you pray to saints? That's, that's an easy one. <laughs> yeah, why don't, why don't you start this one? Uh, well, how many? I'm I am sure because I know a lot of Protestants who have said and and you know back when I was an atheist or or just spiritual, not religious, I would have balked at this idea when anybody said I will pray for you. Mm-hmm. Like, whoa, <laughs> I didn't ask for that. Oh, mm-hmm. that's a, that's a little that's a little personal but the idea i mean how many how many people do we know who have said hey will you pray for me yeah. or they ask their moms to pray well ask your moms to pray for you that's asking mary <laughs> you can ask mary it's the same idea the mother to us all um it's very simple it's just that these are saints are people who are alive living in heaven um and prayers are it's not just a prayer mm-hmm. right these are this is an active uh activity that you can do to help someone um but we ask our, our friends and our parents and coworkers and maybe some random strangers on the internet to, for prayers. We need the help. And the same idea for saints and even better because they're in heaven already aligned. Their will is already fully, completely aligned with Jesus. That's right. And and it's deeply biblical to ask holy people to play, pray for you in the sense that pretty much all Christians feel that there is power in asking other people to pray for you. Catholics just extend that logically to say, hey, you know, these these people, in heaven, they aren't dead. Look at the transfiguration, right? Like look, when St. Paul talks about us being surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, these people are there. They're playing an active role in salvation history. We are that supposed— church triumphant. Yes, the church triumphant. Um, th- they are not dead. They are not indifferent. Um, so we ask for their intercession. We ask for the, so we ask for their intercession. We ask for their prayers, just like we ask for the prayers of anybody else. It's really that simple. And then, kind of to extend that, um, we can offer prayers to those in purgatory because they cannot help themselves. Mm-hmm. So we can ask any. We can ask the saints in heaven to pray for those as well that mm-hmm. we're not sure where the, where they are at the moment. Mm-hmm. So that's a good little quick hitter quick hitter of catholic myths that seriously should just go away yeah i'm sure i mean there are there are others you know do we oh there's re- a million i know re-sacrifice jesus at every mass mm-hmm. uh, uh why do we wear weird costumes <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll turn this into a series there's yeah, uh there's, there's so many this, this will be our, our go-to whenever we're in the midst of sickness and can't think of anything That's... else we'll just, just bust right. up common catholic myths yes well in the you know actually we'll be back in wisconsin so maybe we can make a, a quick trip to holy hill as well oh, yeah. and uh and then maybe i should i should say um if you haven't listened to the episode that, the episode that came up uh two weeks ago with um uh dr marianne or is about keeping your kids kids catholic in college um as it turns out and I, I think i mentioned this later i didn't realize we i've se- we've seen her 
This, right when we were at Holy how about Hill. that yeah mm-hmm. her daughters are very active she's very active her sons are very, her, all of her children are very active in that church and we were visiting and I'm pretty sure that she was sitting in the pew in front of us now that we we're thinking about it so, Providence I know I know but th- that was a great episode too if you haven't listened to that lately as well uh, well um, I guess that's it for tonight that's it this episode it's mm-hmm. time for us to run we hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.